We quite a quite a large group. Welcome everybody from uh, this is Alessandro from UICC. Thanks for waiting a few minutes more into the waiting room. We it's quite a packed uh, session. This one. And this one. Can I quickly just quickly in housekeeping? Can everybody um, to keep your video on unless it causes any disruption with the connection? Uh, please uh, uh, mute yourself. So we'll reduce the background uh, and if necessary we will have to mute you um, but it's not personal <laughs> it's just for the background so well welcome everybody so while uh, I'm just doing a very quick in housekeeping as we wait for people to uh, join in the chat we have uh, more than 200 uh, people sign up to, to this uh, sessions um, hello hi everyone so hi <laughs> so just to start because we're very a lot of equipment, everybody could please uh, mute themselves and maybe Sinead if you can help us with monitoring the microphone so we'll keep the audio acceptable so welcome everybody so this is a, a, a very packed uh, special focus dialogue that we hold in with WHO unit aids and other several other organizations in cervical cancer before giving the a uh, word to Julie Toro who will start the proceedings. Just uh, as I said, a quick housekeeping. Um, as I mentioned before, please keep your uh, microphone uh, switched off unless you are talking. There will be several presentations, but there will also be space for question and answer. Uh, because we're quite a, a big group, obviously we will try to be as inclusive as possible. So we'll take uh, questions at the time also uh, you can raise your hands and, 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 and ask questions directly. But we'll also post a link on the chat box, on the chat uh, box, where you can actually write your questions as the presentation go ahead. So uh, my colleague Sinead will be uh, posting the link soon, and then she will reiterate the link to, in the chat box as the discussion. Will. So you can choose to post a question either via that link, in which you can see also everybody else's question, so you can avoid to repeat themselves and maybe vote for a, for a preferred question. Or you can jump in when the question and answer session. So we want to allow for both the uh, extrovert and the introvert to be participating. But uh, we've now 130 people uh, already in. Um, I think we almost ready. Julie, shall I just uh, uh, pass over to you for an introduction? I have your Thank slides. You. Yeah. Sure, thank you very much, Alessandra. And if you could just take the start of slide. Perfect. So, welcome everyone to this UICC webinar uh, in partnership with the World Health Organization and support from UNAIDS and Women's Global Fund. Uh, we did a cut this morning and we had over 260 registered participants from over 58 countries. So many of you are also representing large networks as well as community level groups. So I think we can promise to help WHO disseminate the perspectives of the survey that we're going to be talking about today. Um, it's amazing to see so many organizations and, and friendly faces on the call. And uh, I think we've already sent a very strong message as civil society to the World Health Organization um, that we as civil society welcome this positive engagement of, of ourselves in WHO processes. And also that we feel really strongly about including women's perspectives on screening and treatment of cervical cancer in the WHO development of guidelines, strategies and other tools in support of, support of the elimination goals that we are so very excited about. So I'd like to welcome you uh, very much to this discussion and also welcome our speakers, but especially our, our speakers who are representatives from organisations that work at grassroots level and can really speak personally about women's concerns. So we have three segments to our session today, so I can just go to the slide that we're going to play. So despite our large attendance, we are aiming to make this as interactive as possible. So please use the chat function and please feel free also to respond to the questions in the chat. Um, and if you have direct questions for our speakers, um, use the question function as Alessandro has explained. 
I do commit to write a short report of all the information shared on the chat and our discussion today. So if you feel you, you can't follow all the chat, you, you, you will get that information reflected back to you. So let's take a look at the session goals for today. We have three interactive elements. And um, the first uh, conversation will really start with getting an update directly from the lead of the Cervical Cancer Elimination Initiative on where the global strategy is towards elimination of cervical cancer. And we'll have an opportunity to really discuss about next steps and particularly the impact of COVID-19 on what those next steps might look like. In the second segment, we're really looking at learning about the WHO guideline process, the guidelines, where our views will feed in, and also taking that discussion as an opportunity to share initial experiences and views with ourselves as well as WHO partners. So I encourage you to use the chat to include very specific examples of your own experience. So even if you can't bring them into the conversation, I'm willing to obtain that report and share them back with you as well as our partners in this guideline element work. Most importantly, the first session is really to provide you with the context of the survey that WHO is conducting and to let you know how you can get involved. So, you know, let's wish that we have a great, uh, um, great session today and uh, we quickly do the first session and ask Dr. Nono Sibeda to let us know where it's in the um, strategy model and what can we expect in the next few weeks and maybe to the next you know, the next activity once this strategy is approved. Over to you, Nono. Thank you very much uh, for that um, introduction, uh, Judy. Um, and can I just say good afternoon, good morning, good, uh, good day to all the people uh, who are on the call. Uh, thank you very much for your support, colleagues and advocates across the world. I have an easy, um, an easy uh, assignment, which is to just give you an update on where the process for the adoption of the strategy is. You know that uh, due to COVID-19, the World Health Assembly had to convene uh, virtually in May, and it was a one-day um, assembly during which there was one item considered which was uh, COVID-19 which was also accompanied by a very a strong resolution on what needs to be done globally to contain the pandemic. So all other submissions, reports, strategies that were meant to be discussed at the World Health Assembly are undergoing what we, are, we call a silence procedure, a written silence procedure. This means that member states have started the process of considering each and every item uh, in their own lo location, in their own geographies. And if there is any um, concern, if there is any issue that they want to raise with regards to that agenda item, they will submit a written intervention for consideration by the president of the assembly uh, who will refer the matter to the director general. Now we are very confident that because the strategy received such a strong strong uh, consensus for adoption at the executive board there was no dissension or issue raised there were minor concerns raised by one member state which were not substantive. Um, we believe that the global strategy for the elimination of cervical cancer will be in the group of documents that will be approved by member states through the silence procedure. We know also that there is an, a second session of the World Health Assembly that will convene virtually in November. And at that point, we ex expect that the World Health Assembly will adopt the strategy formally and we will then be ready to implement. In the meantime, you know you will be aware of the fact that work continues. Um, the objective of the discussion this afternoon, which is the guidelines, 
that are being addressed and worked on by the technical team, uh, members of which will speak this afternoon, is one of the key areas we're focusing on. So in spite of COVID, uh, the development of guidelines is ongoing and other tools that countries will need to implement is still ongoing. So we are preparing ourselves for implementation and we're very, very excited by the prospect of the adoption of the strategy uh, at the latest in the World Health Assembly that will convene in November. And so that is where the process is. And I, I will take any issues or questions on the chat if there are any clarifications. Thanks, Julie. Over Thank to you. you. Thank you very much, Nono. Uh, I have put my headphones on now, so I hope that the audio is a little clearer for people. Um, no, no, I've actually heard from um, the Australia who's championing, championing the resolution and strategy that it may well be as early as July that we get the adoption. Do you think that could be a possibility? Yes, that is a possibility. So we are lining ourselves up for an earlier date. By that I mean we are getting ready on our communications. Uh, we are developing supporting materials for the regions. We have um, reached out to um, a number of partners who are promoting the elimination agenda. Um, there's a filmmaking agency that's going to be also running uh, screenings and films and documentaries and short series uh, on this agenda item. So we are preparing for July and if that is not the deadline or the time for adoption, we will absolutely be ready for November. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nono. Um, let me introduce now Dr. Ian Askew and Dr. Megan Doherty from WHO, um, who will give us a, a little perspective on engaging women uh, and achieving the elimination ambition, and particularly women living with HIV. So over to you, Ian, for your reflections. Okay, thank you, Julie, and uh, thanks, Nono, for the overview on where we are with the uh, elimination strategy. Um, it's very exciting to be part of this because it's um, the issues of trying to address uh, cervical cancer is something that's been a, a central element of sexual reproductive health and rights uh, for, for many, many years now. And there's both the momentum through the elimination strategy and the new technologies that are coming along are all great motivators to, 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 to move this and to increase access to services and to improve uh, uh, treatments and so on. But we're also realizing that um, this cannot be done um, without active engagement of uh, the people affected in, and in this case, women at risk of and uh, of developing cervical cancer um, or living with cervical cancer itself. And so it's been very important for us um, in moving forwards around guidelines generally and in terms of guidance to countries for, um, for, for implementing different interventions that every perspective is included to make sure that services that are being pr provided do meet um, the expressed needs of, uh, of, of women. Um, we've been doing this in various ways and I won't go into detail now because we've, we've got a whole session on this later on. But it's been critically important um, to learn the lessons from working with uh, women's representatives in one area of SRHR to apply these to other areas as well. And I think it's uh, we've we've come a long way over the last few years in in um, in learning not only um, how to do this effectively, but also benefiting from sharing experiences across different areas. Um, this is all uh, critically important for us because underlying all of our work at WHO on sexual and reproductive health and rights are the two key principles of, uh, of achieving gender equality and ensuring that uh, human rights are, are promoted and respected and are used to influence the way in which um, people's health is addressed and services are provided. And that can only be done with the active and meaningful engagement of women in the design and in the implementation of these services. So for us, this, um, this session is incredibly important um, to provide inputs um, from the various women's organizations uh, represented here. And we're looking forward very much to, uh, to, to the discussion and from the input that you'll be providing. So thank you. I'll hand over now to Meg Doherty. Meg? 
Thank you, Ian, and thank you to um, all of the organizers and the participants for having me on. I am uh, the director of uh, the HIV, hepatitis, and STI programs here at, at WHO, and um, I think we bring a different, we're working very closely and jointly with both Ian um, Ian's group as well as um, Nono, who's leading on overall on the cervical cancer. And for us, it's it's very important that, um, and we have a strong tradition of communicating and working with a community of women and end users of our guidelines or of our services, because this is very important for us to, to understand and um, integrate the perspectives before and during and after we develop and then disseminate global guidelines. As you all know, HIV infection disproportionately affects vulnerable girls and women, as does cervical cancer. So that intersection is really important to us, and we want to make sure that as we develop these guidelines, we also look at what are the specificities for, for women who are living with HIV. From our recent review, we know that women living with HIV have a six times higher risk of cervical cancer than women without HIV. And in the case of those who have HIV and cervical cancer, women who have both of these have to contend with not only the double burden of these two diseases and infections, but the double stigma. We've made enormous gains in life expectancy with access to HIV care and treatment, and in countries worse hit by the HIV epidemic, we've really been able to get closest to our 90-90-90 targets and are talking about ending the epidemic. But until recently, cervical cancer among women living with HIV has been largely either not integrated or have not been get in, getting the adequate attention and resources to address these comorbidities. And thus, women are dying of cancer from a very preventable um, infection and disease. So we want to make sure that women's lives are not cut short by cervical cancer and that we improve this through vaccination, screening, and treatment. And today we will be hearing from a lot of different perspectives, but we want to ensure that we have adequate time to hear from your experiences with cervical cancer screening. And, and we hope that the online survey will be one way to hear your voices. For example, we want to know, is same day treatment preferred or not? What is the role of partners, family, community, and what are the difficulties faced in accessing screening services? For us, comprehensive people-centered care across a life course is critical to secure healthy lives. And we see the prioritization of an integrated prevention, screening, and treatment services for both HIV and cervical cancer is a vital, will be a vital part of succeeding on both of these fronts. And so for us, um, we, we definitely are here to, to hear and to listen, and we'll be working with you after you uh, hear some of these uh, uh, presentations. And then once the guidelines are developed, also I'd like to work with you and understand how best to disseminate and ensure that our messaging is well understood and well heard. And lastly, there was a comment about the context of COVID, and we do know that women and around the world and persons living with HIV and those who go to antenatal care, those who go to family planning clinics, those who are seeking cancer treatment have had disruptions in their services, ranging from anywhere from 30 to 60 to 70%, and that varies by setting and, and also um, by country. And so we know that we have to keep an eye out for this as we move forward and not lose the ground that we've so We've, we've, we've gotten quickly further along with cervical cancer screening and treatment, and we don't want to lose that ground that we've already made. So thank you very much, and I pass back uh, to Julie. Thank you. Thanks so much, Meg. And I'd like to hand over now to Benda Kithaka from Kenya um, to you know, really give us a personal view, working very closely with women on screening and treatment of cervical cancer. What, what few perspectives could you share with us, Benda? Over to you. Oh, have we lost, lost Benda? Technology. Hello uh, and greetings great. everybody. This is Benda Kitaka from Kenya. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Women for Cancer Early Detection and Treatment. 
we are an organization that's pa very passionate about cervical cancer elimination. And I want to applaud the WHO uh, for taking the lead in increasing this access to screening and treatment to prevent cervical cancer. I also want to applaud the community that is all working towards making sure that elimination goals are, are targeted and we have the science and the tools and the guidelines that will lead us to the 2030 goal to ensure that we are setting pace for elimination. But I want to, for us to reflect a little bit about the women that we are targeting. I work with women in communities. We are working as partnerships together to see that the adage that we say it takes a village, uh, it takes a village to raise a child actually translates to putting the woman at the center. If you think about cervical cancer affecting women at reproductive age, but also preventable way before girls become women of reproductive age, we need to ask ourselves, why is it that 40 years after the vaccine, uh, after the prevention uh, screening was introduced at, uh, at a large scale, why is it that we still have women who are not owning the process? And therefore, my call to all of us on this call today is to reflect on the woman. How do we work with the guidelines? How do we work with the science and the tools to make it personal for the woman? That the woman whom we are talking about has a face because they're the women we are serving in the community. That we start seeing less loss to follow up. We start seeing less shame and stigma but instead pride in ownership of the prevention journey, that we start seeing women prioritizing cervical health because way before we get to cervical cancer, we have a healthy cervix. How do we get women to own and protect our own? And for this, I want to ask all of us on the call to reflect, even as we are doing the survey, even as we are doing the tools and the guidelines that will enable women to own this process, how do we engage each other in a partnership that the woman owns the process and therefore is inspired to take action towards prevention? That is my rallying call to all of us. Because if we think about the women that we are serving in the villages, they are women with uh, names, they are women with families, they are women with girls that they could be bringing for vaccination. And therefore we need to make this personal to them and to all of us that it stops being numbers and figures and statistics and starts being the one woman that we know who is eligible for prevention and the one girl that we know who is eligible for prevention. I think, Julie, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so, so much. So that as we set the perspective. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for reminding us about the individuals at the heart of this story. So I'll go to the next slide. Um, and I haven't gone into detail. Um, but I will provide more detail in the report for those that aren't so familiar with these issues. But I've just taken a quick view across the continuum of cervical cancer services. And um, some of the work that UICC and others have been doing, we know that HPV vaccination programs have been reduced and largely stopped due to COVID-19. We know that screening has largely been stopped. And we know there are significant fears that this will lead to a shift in the stage at diagnosis and potentially thousands of life years lost just due to these delays. We know there are challenges to the safety of conducting LEAP to treat large, larger free cancers. We know there's surgery delays which are also leading to um, delays in diagnosis and, and treatment of those uh, cancers. We know that even though some cancer centres are starting to return back to routine levels of service, patients are staying away. Even those with strong signs and symptoms of cervical cancer might be staying away. We also know there's some indirect economic impacts that are causing ripples in staff, staffing levels, access to medicines and commodities. We've heard from a number of countries, for example, that we cannot at the moment access radioactive source for brachytherapy due to lockdown and um, um, other um, limitations due to COVID-19. And this is only widening the existing inequities that we know are very um, pertinent for cervical cancer. So I think there's some clear indications that we need to plan for recovery. It's not just business as usual. So I'd really like to open up the conversation to yourselves about how you see we can 
take COVID-19 in our stride and harness the adoption of the global strategy. Uh, but what might change? Um, and you know, one question we already have in Nono to you is, what do you think um, the 90, 70, 90 targets um, over the next 10 years, do you think they will be revisited due to COVID-19? Um, do you think there'll be changes in the support from member states? Or, or do you think this is, this is an agenda they've signed off and, and we will move forward despite uh, the COVID-19 pandemic? What's your views on that, uh, Nono? I think that um, there will be no revisiting of the 1970-90 uh, because we demonstrated through the modeling work that if countries don't get onto this agenda now, we will continue to have more debts. Even as we do the work outlined in the strategy, women who have not benefited from receiving uh, services will continue to advance to invasive cancer. So we, we really are very strong on the agenda of continuing. You know, there are positives that we can build on from the COVID pandemic. Uh, we know that the laboratory platforms have been strengthened. We know now that um, with the social media and how uh, we've been able to reach as many people as possible in WHO with the messages around COVID, we can use that as well. Um, we will have to reconsider the self-sampling approaches because that's going to be a very critical part of the response. So I think we, we must push on because if we take a step back, we are unlikely to reach the elimination as indicated in the strategy. Thank you, Julie. Thanks, Lono, and I'm, I'm glad you're taking a positive approach and um, thinking about the positives uh, that actually COVID-19 might, might open up for us. Um, and the self-sampling is a, a good example. Um, I'm not seeing many questions at the moment, so I'm going to be a cheeky moderator and just pick on a couple of people. Um, Marianne Saville, um, I see you're on the call. Um, you've had some great experience working with colleagues in Malaysia on introducing self-sampling and the health uh, tools. Do you think... Um, that has been able to continue more um, readily because of, uh, despite COVID-19? And would you recommend that people look at your experience and try and learn from that? Sorry to put you on the spot, Marion, but I know you won't mind. That's okay, Julie. Thanks for calling on me. I, I think Yin Ling is also on the call, so I feel a little bit cheeky. So that's been a partnership between um, VCS Foundation and the University of Malaya. And, uh, um, and Perhaps Yin Ling can follow me, but um, certainly uh, the, the Rose Foundation has been interrupted. Um, but I think because we're talking about self-sampling, um, starting to get back to um, offering screening to various groups. So um, uh, I, I think it would be good to hear from Yin Ling, on the, who's on the ground in Kuala Lumpur. Yeah, Hi, Julie, uh, can you hear me? Go ahead. Go Yes. Um, yes. Thank you very much. Actually, this um, I, I'm Yen Leng from Malaysia. I'm one of the advisors for uh, Rose Foundation. Uh, we, for those who don't know us, we use three components to screening, which is self-sampling, HPV testing, and uh, the mobile technology on a on a mobile platform, and really capitalizing on HE Health. And this period of MCO have really, or what we call movement control order in Malaysia, have given us time to read the documents on uh, SRHR. I, I think um, we, it, it really consolidates what we have been trying to, to do, which is to move um, screening from tertiary centers to the community to, be, um, to empower women and to ensure that the linkage then to a hospital is strengthened. What we have learned from the COVID uh, pandemic is that uh, the importance of uh, public health and primary care, uh, we, we have come to appreciate contact tracing um, and the importance of uh, a screening registry. So all those elements, the, the positive that we have learned from COVID is can be brought and can be adopted into cervical screening. So we, we have the ability to accelerate the action based on some of the lessons we have learned. 
Excellent, thank you, thank you very much, Ingle. Well, I, I welcome anyone's views on the chat, um, particularly around the conversation of, because we've had so much conversation in communities about COVID-19, the interaction between the virus and the disease, does anyone feel that it might actually help the HPV conversation? Um, that people now understand a little bit more about the, the, the impact of a virus and the fact that it can cause serious disease. Do you think it might help? I'd like to you know, be interested in seeing people's perspectives. Um, but given the time, I think we'll move on to the next segment. And I invite um, Dr. Natalie Boutet to give us an overview of the screening guidelines and uh, explain to us where this effort fits in and how, um, what, the, what the timeline is in particular. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Julie, and hi, everybody. It's a real pleasure to see um, colleagues and friends on the, on the webinar. So in the next few minutes, I, I would like to share with you where we are at with the guideline development and also to um, explain why we are doing that, that now and uh, what will be the outcomes. So um, first I'd like to uh, acknowledge the joint work we have across many dif different departments in WHO, uh, principally the Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research Department and the Global HIV, Hepatitis and STI program. The next uh, slide, Ajay, I think you uh, okay, so just to remind you, and I think it's, it's, it's a good link with the discussion we just had, that the, these are the, uh, the, the proposed 2030 targets, um, global targets with regard to vaccination, screening, and treatment to be able to reach the elimination before the end of the century. So the uh, age adjusted incidence rate um, has been defined as less than four cases per 100,000 women a year. And to reach that globally, we need to get to the 90% HPV vaccination coverage, 70% of women screened with a high performance uh, test by 35 and 45 years of age, and 90% of women screened positive or identified with cervical cancer disease, uh, cervical disease, be treated and managed adequately. So as it was mentioned, this 70% uh, screening coverage and 90% coverage of treatment is really uh, ambitious targets, but it's really also part of the way and uh, stimulate the, uh, the, the new work that we need to do. So one of the first, the next slide, we had a stakeholder discussion uh, since December 2018 on what should be the priority uh, actions to uh, to support countries to reach these targets. And there are different work streams that we are uh, um, moving uh, in parallel, but one of the most important one is really uh, to uh, update the current guideline, the 2014 guideline that you have uh, here, yes, the, this pink book. Um, and the, one of the reasons, um, you know, it was said that still, and Benda was very clear on that, that it's still very complicated to scale up and many women have not screened or treated uh, correctly. And with this new update, we really, really like to ensure and to make sure that the algorithm are simplified. So that it's, it's really, uh, Meg also raised the issue of the same day screening and treatment, which is certainly an approach that we need to consider. Also uh, treatment based on the positive screening test uh, without triage, so we decrease the number of intervention so that women are really screened and treated um, at the same time and uh, uh, to reach the target, the 2030 targets. Another, of course, in parallel to the guideline, we're developing a number of what we call ancillary product, which will be to support um, introduction of the new guidelines and implementation in country. But also we want to have what we call a living systematic review on screening and treatment it to ensure that we have um, recommendations uh, available for countries as new technologies are coming up. And you know, there is a lot of new, new technology and the evaluation at the moment. We may not have the uh, evidence that we need for the uh, new update, but we will keep on looking at the evidence, the literature, so that we can really have 
almost real-time uh, recommendations. The next slide. So uh, WHO uh, mandate is ready to develop norms and standards. And member states really rely on the expertise of WHO and also of the experts we are calling in uh, and the guidance for the development of international norms and guidelines and promoting the implementation with countries. And it's very important to understand, and again, I'd like to come back to your comment, Benda, on we need to put a, a face on these numbers on, and on these recommendations. And it's true. And that's why I think it's important to understand that the recommendations are judgment. So it takes into consideration the evidence, the numbers, the quality of the evidence, and you know, all this evidence to decision table that we, we, we have to develop to understand the impact on the intervention. But it's also the recommendation, it's a trade-off between the benefits and the and harms of this intervention. It also takes in con in, into consideration the cost. And it takes in con into consideration values and preferences for clients, patients, and for the healthcare providers. And that's where our discussion is important now, because we need to have this information for when the guideline development group meet to develop the recommendation, we can have all the information that we can provide so that we can have the, the, the best recommendation as we can. The next slide. So um, the, the guideline, what are the guidelines about? So first we, uh, this table is just to give you the summary of the process and what we've been doing. So at the beginning, we said, well, we are going to have a guideline for women living with HIV because we, we wanted really to address three questions in this guideline. Simple questions, but very important. The age at first screening for women with HIV, the frequency of screening and the interval between screening, whether the screening test is positive or negative. And then we had also another, which is on the right, on another uh, guideline development group, we started to look at all the screening and treatment recommendation, all the algorithm for all the women, including women with HIV. And in fact, after, you know, uh, some time and analyzing the document, preparing the scoping document, working with the methodologies, with systematic review groups, so and the guideline development group, we decided to merge the two documents. So what we are now, we have the scoping document, which has been uh, um, uh, approved by the WHO guideline review committee in September and in January this year for the big, big document. And now we have merged the two documents and we have only a guideline and we have merged also the guideline development group. So we have only uh, one guideline that will address all the questions that we need to address. The next slide. So this, uh, at, so this is a little bit more technical, but just to give you a flavor of the type of question we are addressing in this guideline. So we have, you know, the guidelines are based on what we call PICO questions, uh, the population for the P, uh, intervention for the I, comparison for C and O outcome. And so we look at the, um, we have 14 PICO questions and it's about screening and treatment screening, triage, and treatment. And this is uh, the follow-up studies and the also diagnostic studies. And it's really about, should we use one screening test and the tr and one screening and treat strategy versus another one? And the other set of questions is about, should we use screening, triage, and treatment strategy versus another uh, screening treatment, uh, triage and treatment strategy? Then we have the follow-up. And these are the, what type of follow-up should be done after the treatment. And this is a, in the group of women, um, follow-up after negative test or follow-up after a positive test. And this is for the general population of women. And these are specific questions that we want to address for women with HIV. And then finally, we have the question about treatment, which is the interval between the test and treatment you know, what is the minimum, maximum interval that a woman should be treated after she has a positive screening test. And the same of the efficacy of the, of, of the treatment, of the different modality of treatment. The next slide. And these are really the, for all these different questions, 
the algorithm, the follow-up, and the treatment is really the outcomes uh, that we are interested in. And when I say we, it's really, it's not really WHO, but it's a guideline development group, which include, as I was mentioning, it's about 60 people, including representatives from the different countries, program, agencies, associ association, civil society, so it's quite of a big group. And we've classified the outcomes into three groups. This is really in, in red or in orange, uh, outcomes linked to the impact of the treatment, of the screening and treatment. Uh, in red or rose, this is the outcome uh, linked to sexual and reproductive health. And in blue, it's more linked to programs, programmatic uh, outcome. And this is really, for each of these questions, we are trying to look the outcome. And you can imagine that in the literature, we don't have always the outcome we are interested in. So we really need to have a modeling exercise. So we, we're working with the Karen Canfold in, in Australia uh, on the modeling of the different algorithm and uh, um, potential impact they could have on the different outcomes. And again, this modeling is for general population of women and women with HIV because we know the impact may be different. So we really look at all these different aspects. The next slide. And I'd like just to summarize, so this is not how the algorithm would be presented. I'm speaking about simply, sim, simpler algorithm. Uh, but just to give you in a nutshell, the type of screening and treatment we're looking at. So first, these are the asymptomatic women eligible, eligible for screening, independently of their statue, right? And then this is the first screening test we are looking at, VIA, HPV, DNA, self-collection or provider collection, HPV, RNA test, cytology, co-testing. And then, depending on the result of this first screening test, we look at if it's negative, what will be the follow-up? If it's positive, in this case, we, we, we look at the impact of a positive screening test followed by an immediate treatment, uh, ablative treatment, if the woman is eligible for ablation, and a referral or leave treatment if they are not. So this is really, you know, the screen and treat approach. And here we have the screen, they are positive for the screening test, and we look at the impact of the triage test. So there is a triage test that we're looking at here, and what should be done and what will be the follow-up if the triage test is negative and or whether if it's positive. So this is really the type of algorithm we're looking at. Um, the next slide. And I want to say also that for some of the uh, tests that we know we don't have uh, enough evidence yet that the, for the one I was mentioning that we will do systematic, living systematic review. This in, will include uh, E6, E7 oncoprotein test, uh, but also the uh, uh, automated visual evaluation, which is uh, artificial intelligence that, and, that will support screening uh, uh, of uh, women. So in addition to these uh, questions and the outcome, the GDG recommended really that we add implementation PICO questions. And this uh, linked at what are the health system interventions that enable the adoption, implementation, and scale up of effective screening approaches. There is also the uh, question on the effects of patient targeted strategies to support the uptake and, uh, of screening approaches. And the, uh, the last question is about the effect of provider targeted strategy to support the adoption of screening approaches and the follow-up care. So you see that, and, 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 I hope it, and I hope it will take a little bit in consideration what you were mentioning really, to look at all these different interventions that are important so to, to implement and to ensure that these recommendations can be scaled up. The next slide. So this is, uh, the, and uh, um, we'll finish with that because I think it's important uh, that we understand that this is a huge uh, working group on that, a, group, a huge group of um, uh, systematic reviewer. So we have, you know, the PICO one and two about screen and treat, screen three and treat that are uh, led by Beatrice lobby Secretan from IARC. So this group is very active uh, because we're really waiting for all the systematic review results, as well as the diagnostic studies group, 
uh, led by Mark uh, Arbin and Helen Kelly from the London School and Mark from the Ghent University. And we have all the follow-up after positive or negative tests, which is led by Nancy Santeso from the McMaster University. And Nancy is also coordinating all these working groups so that we have really the same methodology and harmonization in the methods. Then we have this group that is led by Carrie Vincent-Strum on the follow-up uh, of a woman with HIV and the duration of the, uh, and the treatment led by Catherine Sauvage. And the implementation questions are led by Nancy Santeso and Patty Gravit from the University of Maryland. The next slide. We have other working group uh, that we really uh, needed to have to define the, all the different outcomes. Uh, also, we have the, the uh, working group that defined the, what that means a, a woman to be eligible for ab, uh, ablative treatment. Uh, the modeling working group that I was mentioning for when we don't have outcome and the value and preferences uh, working group that we're going to discuss now. So it's many uh, working group and we are all uh, reporting to the guideline development group regularly and we get their feedback and their approval on what we're doing. The next slide. And this is the last one. So just to uh, give you um, an idea of our calendar. So the next uh, meeting of the GDG, the guideline development group will be with the uh, modeling so that we have a first uh, um, uh, information about the results of the modeling work of the LP. Then we have the first um, guideline development group meeting for the recommendation on the treatment of cervical precancer lesions. And between September and October, and we, we, we're still organizing that, we will have a series of meetings, virtual meeting, to go through all the recommendations. So it may be a week, meeting every week of four hours, and we'll take all the PICO questions one by one. And hopefully, if it works, we'll have the recommendation ready by first quarter of 2021. And the last one is just to uh, thank all my colleagues here that are from the different departments with uh, who we are really working hard on all these guidelines. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll be happy to respond to any questions. Thank you very much. Natalie, as you can see, it's a major, major undertaking, including so many academic and civil society groups. Um, so I hope for those that are less aware of what is behind the WHO guideline, um, that, that it gives you a real insight into how much work is put into making sure we have the up-to-date recommendations and uh, I for one are very happy that you mentioned the almost live uh, opportunities to update guidelines in future um, because it is such a dynamic area for cervical cancer screening at the moment with the new exciting um, innovations that are coming in so um, I'm, I'm glad that WHO is looking to respond to that um, actively as well. Any questions, Alessandro or Sinead? Have you seen questions directly for Natalie to clarify on her presentation, or shall we move straight on to the next presenters? Because it's uh, really linked uh, to that presentation. We, I'll invite Walker Newman or Reedy to talk about um, how WHO's work towards understanding the contribution of HIV to the cervical cancer burden and how that now um, will uh, engage in the elimination strategy and, and also this guideline process. Over to you, Morco. Um, many thanks, Julie, and um, good day and greetings to all. Um, thank you very much all for joining this. Our presentation is really focused on emphasizing the very critical importance of the burden, the dual burden of HIV and cervical cancer acknowledging it and recognizing the intersection and seeing how best we can use this to plan and implement the elimination of cervical cancer strategy. So first slide really shows us the estimate of the HIV contribution to the cervical cancer burden. As Meg said, women living with HIV have a six and over six times more risk of developing cervical cancer. And the map shows you the proportion of women with cervical cancer who are living with HIV. And this was in the year 2018. So you'll find that the deeper colors, which are the red colors, 
uh, where the proportion is as high as 40 to 75 percent. And many of you will know this overlaps very much with the HIV prevalence that we have in these same regions. So the range is from as low as 10 to 75 percent of um, women who have cervical cancer who are living with HIV. Our focus is mainly on the countries with the dual burden for the elimination, and we are reviewing available research and data, and also looking at modeling, impact modeling of HIV and cervical cancer in these high burden settings. Next slide, please. So our work is really focused on updating the screening and treatment of cervical pre-cancer in women living with HIV, which Natalie has alluded to. And it, this re-emphasizes that our current guidance is that we have screening in women and girls who have initiated sexual activity as soon as they have tested positive for HIV. And this is regardless of their age. So they are, in the current guidance, they're rescreened 12 months after pre-cancer treatment or within three years after the negative screening results. So our updating is focused on the age of initiation and the frequency, as Natalie said. And we have literature reviews which have found few data on age. And even where the data was available, they had different age categories. And we are now collecting data from individual studies to look at our individual clients. The output we hope for is an optimum algorithm for screening and treatment of women living with HIV. And Ajay will go into more details because we'll be exploring the different screening tests and the treatment options. Next slide, please. So for this, we really need a better understanding of the end users and the other related activities. So like we said, the qualitative literature review and values and preference surveys, which is what this um, webinar is going to be focused very much on, is what we are going to use to provide our information, the literature review of women's preferences, and then very importantly, this anonymous global online survey among women living with HIV to advise the how to best to address the gaps in the literature. As you may know, WHO has convened a women living with HIV advisory group, and this group is really important for us because they have been updated on the work of cervical cancer elimination and the area of focus, which is HIV. They did review and gave feedback on the online survey, and we're really grateful for that. This exercise will also feed into the revision of the WHO guidelines on the use of antiretrovirals. And the next phase would be implementation support to countries. So in a nutshell, that's where we are with our work in this area. Over. Thank you very much, uh, Moko. And um, Manjula, have you uh, a few perspectives to add? Hi, thanks very much, Julie. Um, and thanks everyone um, to Natalie and colleagues. Uh, I was asked to provide a brief overview of one example of community engagement in WHO guidance. And so I will just maybe share my screen and see if that works. And just give a, um, an overview of, of work we have done with um, uh, groups of women living with HIV uh, in from from actually you know over a decade now, and uh, which resulted in the guideline on SRHR of women living with HIV. So let me just um, share my screen if I can do that. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yep. Yes, thank you, Manjula. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'll try and be relatively fast, but you know, uh, this is about the community engagement and um, how best to, you know, how best to meaningfully engage them uh, throughout not only the development of guidance, but also the implementation. And um, there's been already, you know, a tremendous amount of work in, in WHO, but there's still a lot that can be done. And uh, so this one example uh, is for, you know, this particular guideline. 
and um, m many of the women who are living with HIV who had been involved, I can see some of their names on the chat, so perhaps they can provide even you know, better input than me. But one of the things we did from the very start uh, for this guideline, and this was one of the first times this had happened within WHO guideline development process, was to ask women themselves what their priorities were in terms of their sexual and reproductive health and rights. And this allowed for um, uh, uh, an engagement, not only from the start, but uh, a process that was led by and for women living with HIV. And the report that came out of, the, of this global survey that was conducted, as well as focus group discussions that they conducted, is uh, part of this report about uh, building a safe um, house on a firm ground. And I won't have time to go through this in great detail, but a lot of the key elements of what they felt was really important in their engagement uh, within health, health sector and um, uh, in terms of advancing their health is noted here, uh, including, for instance, I mean, uh, gender equality and human rights were mentioned, but just, just you know, respect and dignity and safety and support and, um, and you know, meaningful engagement were some of the elements that came up. And so we took this very much to heart and you, you saw the image of the house. The house is now at the center of this framework that was developed for the guideline. And it's really about placing the women living with HIV and their needs and their rights at the center of this process. And, um, and so, it's, it's, so it's not so much about um, eliminating a disease or a, a health condition, but it's really about meeting their needs and rights. And this needs to be done in the context of that safe and supportive enabling environment, which, which we mentioned. That includes protection from violence and, you know, and, and creating that safety and um, community empowerment, the, the need for supportive laws and policies and access to justice and, and a number of issues that we, um, we, we've addressed in this framework. And, and I'm sharing this because, well, I firstly, I love this photo of Laurangelis, uh, but it's, it was, we got, you know, a, a lot of positive feedback from the women who were so, who were so deeply engaged in this process. And, and it's really about providing an opportunity, not only to contribute to the guidance, but also um, uh, in, in the evidence base and the review. So a lot of their input and their lived reality ends up being in either gray literature mm -hmm. or as, as not really in the peer reviewed literature, which we end up using for systematic reviews, for instance, but to, to, to assist in getting that out into the evidence base because this, um, their experiences are so valuable. And um, so it's not just about, Ian mentioned this at the beginning of this discussion, it's not just about involving in the development of guidance, but also uh, meaningful engagement in implementation. And I'm just sharing two documents that came out um, quite recently in how do you translate that community research into global policy and action. And you know, this is really sort of a toolkit and uh, that, that has sort of a checklist of, of what countries can do and partners can do at national level to better engage with um, communities and particularly vulnerable, uh, vulnerable communities. And then, um, and also to start documenting the strategies that communities themselves can do that, that, are, that they are leading and that can contribute um, uh, to, to the guidance process and further, um, you know, to, to improve their health and well-being of the women and and the families and the communities that they're part of. Um, it was Markor mentioned just earlier that uh, uh, an advisory group of women living with HIV was established at WHO, and it's really thanks to this process of you know this this guideline that um, you know it was taken as an example of best practice for WHO and the establishment of. The, the WHO wide advisory group was uh, was put in place last year, and um, and we can go you know we can I'm happy to answer questions about that and Sophie who's uh, Sophie Domitis who's the chair of the advisory group is online so I can probably answer to to the questions and and at the end I just wanted to I'm, I'm sharing the slide from some of our indigenous um, uh, women with HIV um, who you know 
while we're doing all this talking, there are a lot of women who are suffering, particularly the more vulnerable women who are suffering uh, morbidities and, and death uh, due to not only cervical cancer, but a range of sexual and reproductive health and HIV related issues. And so it really behooves us to move fast, to move efficiently, and to make sure that we walk the talk when we say we're going to meaningfully engage with women living with HIV. Thank you so much. Over. Thank you very much, Julia, for that very um, pertinent example. And um, I don't know if uh, there are people that were part of that work that would like to offer some perspectives on how that might translate into this um, current uh, example of activity. Whilst you're thinking about that, I will hand over to the moderator of our next conversation um, and I'd like to introduce Ani Shakarishvili from UNAIDS um, to, monitor, uh, to moderate the next conversation. Um, over to you, Ani. I'm sure you're... Thank you, Julie, you very much. Can you hear me well? You can indeed, go ahead. Good, thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be part of this family and the community and be with you on this webinar. Um, just before I start um, this conversation with two wonderful activists who have joined us from Malawi and Uganda, um, I'd love to just in, in a couple of sentences just reiterate the commitment of UNAIDS um, in, uh, in uh, joining and uh, supporting the elimination movement mm -hmm. and the strategy and the uh, way we do that is coming from the people-centered, human rights-based, gender equality-based and um, needs-based approaches. And we've seen in the AIDS movement how those are so important. Um, I'd love to also stress on the, the importance of looking at how we could really best bring in communities into the cervical cancer elimination movement, engage them more as we've done in the AIDS world. Because the community engagement is about ensuring the equitable access to uh, scaled quality services and higher performance technology <coughs> at no fee. And also looking at how their role we could support all across the world in uh, ensuring the acceptable services are provided that are feasible, but also as the COVID and AIDS both have, uh, have shown how important it is to also address the structural factors. If a woman doesn't have uh, food or transportation, even with high performance technologies, we cannot ensure the access. Um, in the UNAIDS and in the AIDS response, we've also seen how important it is uh, for communities to actively participate in demand creation, as well as engaging other communities um, outside their narrower circle, and also the community-led monitoring including for implementing the guidelines and the quality of their implementation as well as quality of services. And the access to new technologies have to start with that also demand creation. And uh, of course for that, the resources are needed and the community's voices are so much strong and important in mobilizing and demanding those resources. So with that, what I would like to do is perhaps introduce our two activists, let them introduce themselves better than myself. And uh, uh, with that intro after that introduction, if I may ask them to elaborate more, I uh, elaborate more on what their experiences have been as women, as community members, as community activists what it is that women uh, uh, are dealing with when trying to get access to screening 
and treatment, quality screening and treatment, and what we all need to take into account when not only developing the guidelines, but how to implement those for the best access uh, to quality uh, screening, treatment, and also continuum of care. So um, I don't know, Mara, if you want to start, maybe, and then we'll be Gertrude. So please introduce yourself and then uh, reflect on some of that. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. I hope you can hear me. Uh, we can indeed, can Mara. Me? We can, Mara. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, as already alluded to, my name is Mara Kumbwe Sabanda. I am coming from Malawi. And first of all, I'd like to thank you for having me on this platform and giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of my fellow um, <coughs> women in the community. Um, I don't know whether you just want me to do that introduction or we go, I go straight ahead into my discussion at this moment. Julie, can you guide me? Please, please, please I just want to know, please introduce yourself. We'd love to hear more about what you do. Okay. Okay, so I'm um, a community woman. I'm coming from the grassroots and I founded an organization in 2003 called Pradiso TB Patients Trust, which just started as a, as a hobby to um, support my fellow women in the community because we had been ravaged by HIV as well as TB. And I found that um, the, issue, my, the issues that I had with the TB were to me more painful and then there wasn't a lot of information going around in my community. So I founded this organization mainly to, uh, to support that. Um, I'm glad to say that the organization has since grown into a local organization and we now work in 10 districts across the country. However, I have now also become involved with issues of cervical cancer because of um, my life story and what I went through at one level. I think in, in around the same time in 2002, I had a lot of issues with my, my menstruation and I didn't really understand what was going on. So when I visited my health um, facility, the doctors examined me and they recommended that I get my uterus removed to stop all the problems that I was having with my mains. There was no information at all on the reasons why my uterus should have been removed at that level. And no one spoke anything about cervical cancer. It was just like, um, if we remove your uterus, this problem that you're having will be resolved. And because um, at that time you grasped with anything, especially what I was facing, my menstruation was so heavy and it was really clotted and very frequent, almost maybe after every five days. So um, I agreed and um, that was done. I sort of um, got some relief. And it's only later on in, in life that um, I realized that whatever I was facing at that time, now understanding better all the signs um, of um, cervical cancer issues, that it must have been um, something to do with cervical cancer. I did go back to my health providers and had discussions with them where indeed they confirmed, but they said during that time, um, the, the, the medical fraternity within Malawi really didn't have the opportunity to be able to share that kind of information. It was deemed very technical and that an ordinary woman wouldn't be able to understand. So they'd better tell you, give you an information that you'd be able to understand and take a decision upon. So um, that is um, the part of my life that has found me in this um, part. So when I had an opportunity and also realizing now um, being exposed to so many platforms and so many um, documents that um, share information with me, I've realized that there's a very strong um, synergy between HIV as well as um, cervical cancer, as it is the same with um, TB somehow. So um, I found myself also um, responding to issues of cervical cancer um, up and down across my country. And what I'd like to share, I feel that are the challenges that we find as um, women coming from some uh, rural communities and even the peri-urban settings. And um, first of all, the issue that we have is um, lack of information. The information on cervical cancer is not really flowing very effectively in Malawi as a country. And this makes, provides a challenge for the women to be able to make a decision to go for um, cancer screening. And secondly, it's also the distances to the um, centers where these services can be provided because they've got um, a, an economic implication where the woman has to spend to be able to go to that facility. If you've got our bigger facilities like the central hospitals where the services are really good for these um, kinds of um, uh, conditions, 
they have got a waiting list of which they enlist all the women and then you can be going back and forth until they get to um, a place where they can provide you a, a space which is also stressful though, for the women so i feel that if they the um at least if the screening could be moved a little lower where it could be accessible to the um, women that would be um good for us uh as well as um also issues of um cultural norms you know how the the cervical cancer screening um, tests are done so most of the women are not happy even the husbands are not happy to allow the women to um to for them for the women to go and and undergo this test so if we had enough information flowing within the communities i think this would be begin to change the status quo so uh to copy a leaf from what we have done in the hiv sector where we've got all the community volunteers i think these people can be used as well to be able to support um, the, the cervical cancer issues, because then would have a refer reference point. A person could be able to ask the next person, oh, I'm seeing this, what, what is, does it mean? Or how do I get to the facility? And even connecting them with the health providers by doing referrals once a person is seeing the signs. But the people are not very conversant on these um, issues. And then um, in Malawi, we've got very few organizations that are working on issues of cervical cancer and they're not really well coordinated. So we have got pockets of organizations working on this um, disease, but we are not really coordinated. And then we can have those individuals working in another field, as I do, but also dealing with issues of cervical cancer whenever I meet groups of women in the different um, areas. At the, um, at the government level, I think Malawi has come up with um, um, a strategic, a cancer, cervical cancer strategic plan, which was um, running actually from, um, 2017 to 2022 but it's not widely publicized so not many people know about this strategy and then i had to do a lot of fishing as well to be able to find that we had this type of document as well as looking at other policies they are not there we've got um the shrh policy and we've got a um a component or a chapter built into that which is mentioning on issues of cervical cancer and how the health providers can take action on this. But I don't think many people are aware of this. And also considering that the policy itself is not actually saying cervical cancer, not many people would be interested to pick it up and then um, use it. On the HP um, vaccine that has been um, going around, Malawi also had an opportunity to do that. I think we've vaccinated a number of girls in 2019, first of all in January, and then the second um, vaccine in July after this on the same group. But since that, nothing else has happened. And then that also seemed to be a bit biased to me because it was targeting school going um, young girls. So there are a number of um, children who actually don't go to school, but there was nothing that was done deliberately to do um, with that. So for me, I'd like to see some tools also targeting these areas that I'm mentioning, or maybe looking at um, countries to be supported, to be able to have these instruments that will be able to um, help the um, providers um, uh, uh, provide the service very um, effectively. And uh, then again, um, I think at the country level, I've not seen any um, a, a definitive targets that um, we plan to reach. Apart from the vaccine that was going around, which had specified targets of which everybody working in the health sector, including us members of the community, we knew them. But on the cervical cancer, I think there isn't much um, information going on on our targets, as well as um, any other data like say on incidents, we, we have got very stale information that everyone is using around. So for me, this is what I'd like to share with this group, that as we go into um, defining these um, tools, we can also consider these areas where for me, I feel as at the country level, most of the women were being affected because of this. Thank you very much. I hand back over to Annie. Thank you. Mara, thank you very, very much. Appreciate all this uh, different context you had brought. and. I'm just conscious of time, so perhaps Gertrude could introduce herself and her views. And I know that Benda wanted to, to uh, bring in a few really important um, issues. So maybe after Gertrude, uh, we will uh, hand over to Benda for her very interesting comment about you know, the role of communities in uh, looking into implementation um, and quality of implementation and actionable solutions. So Gertrude, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Anne, and hi everybody. In the interest of time, I'll be brief, and my sister has uh, elaborated a lot on the community challenges. 
Uh, my name is Gertrude Nachigude. I'm a breast cancer survivor and I head an organization of uh, women who have survived cancer and the uh, cervical cancer. So um, I've worked with the women in the communities on uh, awareness and then mobilizing the communities for screening. I think what we need to, my call for everyone is to reflect on this woman we are uh, looking at today uh, because we are we are designing guidelines but what is what kind of woman are we looking at where does she live what other challenges that this woman has in her life uh, in my experience as a community uh, person women are not only experiencing cancer but they have other challenges HIV uh, domestic violence and the, the bigger challenge as my sister from Malawi alluded is that uh, information is a big challenge uh, women are not aware that cervical they're not aware of the causes the the prevention measures with some women at the community is not aware that uh, the difference between uh, HIV and HPV and the, 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 the health system challenges, the screening is not closer to the people. And if they screen, where do they go? So I think as we think of a woman we want to allow to go to, to screen, we need to empower this woman to willingly and routinely seek the services as in the guidelines. If it's one year, is this woman able to remember that after one year, I have to go for, H for H HPV screening? Or cervical screening. If I if I'm negative, then after three years, am I able to go to the health worker and they say, "Hey, my time for screening." So I think empowering the communities is still a big challenge, and because they have other social psychological problems that they deal with, culture, uh, as my sister mentioned, uh, as a woman, the way that, that the women are screened, uh, the husbands will not uh, allow because they feel it's not. Uh, it's, it's a violation of their women's rights. So information to both the women and then the, the, the men. Uh, and we have the issue of health seeking behavior, whether they're educated or not. Our women only seek care when they see symptoms. So I think uh, we need to increase awareness of, on the benefits, on the needs of having the screening. And that comes from the, the, the lack of information because if women knew that if I screened and they got early, early treatment, then I benefit. Uh, there is a fear of diagnosis. Uh, you know, uh, when I had a diagnosis 18 years ago, I didn't know what to do. And people were asking, why did you go to check? So that question still comes even up to today. Women are not willing to check because they've been told you have cancer and they, they know cancer equates to, to death. And as civil societies, I think we, uh, uh, if I go to the role of civil societies, as, as, as an organization in Uganda, we've closely worked with the government. And uh, two years ago, we worked to develop communication messages to increase HPV uh, va vaccine uptake. Uh, because uh, five years ago, we had the HPV vaccine, but the uptake was so low. And they all went into the lack of communication and then lack of information of the benefits, the safety. So I think as we think of guidelines, we need to think of those key messages that we have to take it to the communities so that people receive the services with the trust. Um, we've also worked with the Uganda Cancer Institute on community outreaches, uh, screening. So uh, partnerships has been very, very key in our, in our work. And we've worked with all other partners to make sure that women receive screening, but still even where the services are available, the uptake is still low. And all that goes to information and awareness because this woman is not, is not empowered enough to understand the benefits, the value, and then what saves her to, to, to receive the screening. And I think as civil societies, we have a big role here to play wherever we are. Uh, to mobilize the communities, to use our own experiences. For example, we have a lot of women who have survived cancer, women who have, are living with HIV for a long time. So if these women are empowered to work with the communities, to use their own experiences 
and work with the with the with the and work with the communities. So I think we shall increase uptake of these services. And also we work as advocates because we engage, we lobby, and we sit at a table and, and they bring the issues of patients so that the, these issues are understood and then they are planned accordingly. The bigger challenge we've had as civil society is that we are never given resources. And I think uh, people on the call, I know maybe there may be uh, resource, resources somewhere. I think as we plan and then we cost the, the strategy, let's, put, let's incorporate the, 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 the resources for civil societies to work as equal partners into, uh, into our, our efforts. Otherwise, the communities will be left out. I think for now, I want to thank you so much. I'm mindful of time. I want to go very deep into details, but at least that is my perspective on how we can increase cervical screening and then treatment. Thank you so much, and Thank you, Gertrude, so much, and uh, appreciate you touching upon all these aspects, including differentiated approaches uh, for different groups of women and individual uh, women, as well as the continuum of prevention and treatment and ensuring also that support services, including addressing some of the structural barriers and the safety issues and trust are so important. And of course, uh, as UNAIDS, I cannot not stress the importance of what you said at the end about the resources for community groups and civil society themselves to also play this critical role other than just being um, th those that will be receiving those services, but being great advocates and uh, bringing in partnerships as well. So maybe in the remaining time, I could um, uh, go to Benda because she had a very good comment and, and then we can wrap up after her. Benda, can you elaborate more on what you said in the chat box? One moment. Um, thank you once again for inviting me to speak into this uh, very uh, critical discussion that's happening right now. And my comment was that we need a critical, critically to address uh, translating the guidelines, the frameworks, the, int the interventions into actionable solutions for women and having regular follow up on the implementation of plans so that they can regularly be updated to address new dynamics in the community of practice. And in addressing this, I just want to point out that both the two advocates who have just spoken before me have raised critical questions. For example, how do we get to behavior change where women normalize screening and women normalize vaccinating our girls as prevention for cervical cancer? The second one is, who do women go to for authoritative information? Because what I'm hearing is there is not enough information, but we have enough research being done in uh, low and middle income countries. How do we translate this into actionable solutions? The third question that has been raised is adoption. Who are the influencers that can bring people to adopt these interventions so that they become the normal to do? And from this comment, then I draw the parallel to the Kenyan situation where we currently have the Stop Cervical Cancer Initiative, an initiative that's formed by 20 organizations uh, championed by the Ministry of Health in collaboration with Women for Cancer, the organization that we co-founded. And the Stop Cervical Cancer Initiative is addressing all these issues around coordination, adoption, behavior change communications, and authoritative information uh, delivery to the community so that then people can take pride in prevention. Knowing that information, having enough information is not enough if it is not utilized for implementation, we went ahead and formed the Stop Cervical Cancer Initiative so that then we can have a national advocacy platform that is geared towards every January celebrating and commemorating cervical cancer interventions. We've had two events in the last two years. At the same time, having this as an opportunity to coordinate together with the Ministry of Health and other actors in the space so that we can address the question that Gertrude is mentioning about resourcing. 
as long as we're working as civil society organizations in our own different uh, spheres of influence, without the coordination that is required for all of us to pull our resources together, we find that our resources will always be limited. But if we are working together, then we can be able to bring the thread that connects the researchers to the community, that connects the facilities to the service delivery, and that also brings back the mechanism for feedback to the decision makers so that policies can be put in place that address all these challenges. And so my rallying call to all of us is also to think about, as we're thinking about addressing these translating guidelines into actionable solutions, we also think around how do we engage influencers and critically, as Gertrude has mentioned, cervical cancer survivors or even cancer survivors across board and people who can be given um, advocacy skills to bring authoritative information to the community. Because ultimately, women live in the community and the thread that connects all of us to the cervical cancer elimination issue is women themselves. And therefore, if we can have that information translated to application and then feedback mechanisms, we'll have addressed that issue of um, tying in the strategy to the implementation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Benda, very much. Uh, thank you, Mara, thank you, Gertrude, thank you, uh, Benda, for all these uh, amazingly important thoughts and ideas, as well as uh, sharing your experiences. Uh, all of those, together with what we've seen up, up until now in the countries, uh, in the response to cervical cancer, in the response to HIV AIDS, and now COVID stress the importance of the mobilization of communities, their own role also in service delivery, in advocacy and support, as well as political advocacy, and the awareness raising and demand creation, including for the guidelines themselves at the country level, and then their implementation and the role in Thanks, uh, that. Thanks. Sorry, Annie, I'm going to have to oh, jump in because yeah. uh, I I do want to give AJ some time for the most important piece today about you know, what, what exactly is, is the survey that WHO is planning and how can we as civil society get involved. So over to you AJ to give people a short context of where it comes from and what is happening and what the time frame is. Thanks very much. Hi everyone, so uh, can everyone see my uh, slides? Ajay, it's the um, wrong screen. It's you just oh, yeah. your screen. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, so I'll begin. So firstly, uh, I'd just like to quickly introduce myself. My name is Ajay Rangraj. I'm a consultant who works in the Department of HIV, Hepatitis and STIs. And uh, I'll be talking about the survey that uh, we're planning to do. Uh, and this is really sort of the core of uh, you know, the work that we're doing uh, as part of the guidelines. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, firstly, I think, you know, I think at this point, uh, several of the speakers prior to me have already sort of covered uh, what the guideline development group is, the, gui the role of the guidelines review committee. The next really important piece is really methodology and uh, the approach that WHO uses in its guidelines to uh, develop uh, recommendations, so to speak. Um, so, the GRADE approach is a method by which we evaluate quantitative and qualitative evidence, economic evidence all together to help inform a guideline because really the aim is to collect all information that is relevant to a particular research question and present it to the expert group that will then deliberate and ultimately make a decision on WHO guidelines. So for convenience, GRADE is divided into what we call domains, which are essentially topic areas, which I'll get to in a second. So when it comes to incorporating uh, the domains, particularly in this case, patient preferences and values. Um, really, there are three basic approach, uh, approaches that the Guidelines Review Committee recommends that we follow. So one is, of course, a systematic review of qualitative literature that's been published in uh, peer-reviewed journals. The next is you could do a primary survey of relevant stakeholders. So in this case, it's women in general, really, um, and also a primary survey for uh, women living with HIV and uh, which I will discuss in more detail uh, in a 
couple of minutes. And then, of course, the guidelines development group itself, which is the expert group that we convene, may also serve as a focus group to voice opinions and preferences, uh, which is relevant because uh, you know persons are represented across the board in terms of academics, program managers, civil society advocates, uh, so on and so forth. So. As far as evidence goes, this is really sort of what we do. This has been taken from the GRADE uh, Pro website, which is a software that you can also use potentially sometimes. Um, so really, what are the key domains that we want to inform? So uh, as you can see, the red arrows will tell you that we look at values, um, measures of equity, acceptability, and even sometimes feasibility. So really, the primary survey is trying to reach or help inform these particular pieces of evidence that will be presented to the guideline development group. So, as I said, we would also do a qualitative review of evidence, and this is really just an example of what that will look like. And so, in this case, this is an excerpt from uh, a part of uh, just from the ongoing uh, review that we're doing. So, this in this case, it's uh, we uh, one of the key themes that we identified in published literature was lack of knowledge and awareness of screening practices. So now this would typically feed into acceptability because they essentially said that women are less likely to uptake, you know, screening if they don't actually know it exists, which makes sense. So this is sort of like a mapping process, so to speak. So using this, we actually identified key knowledge gaps, and also we understood that it's very critical to sort of involve sort of uh, the word to use probably is grassroots perspectives in the actual discussions at the guidelines uh, development meeting. And this is a really important piece of evidence that will be used to make decisions and recommendations. So some of the key points I just wanted to touch on is, we want to understand what your experience and exposure to screening for cervical cancer is or was if you've already been screened. What are the main problems uh, you face or you have faced when trying to attend screening? What are your main concerns when thinking about being screened? And what would you do if you found yourself in certain health-related scenarios, which I will be explaining with an example uh, in a couple of slides? And then what your preferences are in terms of how often you need to visit the clinic? I think several of these points were captured uh, by the speakers who preceded me. So this is really what we'll be asking. And then also, of course, understand the above-mentioned issues uh, among both women in general and among women living with HIV. And also when I say general population, the aim is to be as inclusive as possible. So I, uh, an important concern that came forward is how, what about women who have actually survived cancer or who are undergoing treatment for invasive cervical cancer? And this is really, we aim to include everybody in this particular survey. Now, the main headliners for the surveys on how we designed it is that it is completely anonymous, so your responses are both secure and untraceable because you know, we really understand the very personal nature of uh, this sort of information, sharing your preferences on what is in many countries a very sensitive issue. Um, the next is it is all online, and really this is sort of a, a trial of trying to use technologies to enable uh, so people in countries to provide us perspectives and really it's a starting point to examine the best ways of incorporating prefer patient preferences in a WHO guideline. Uh, the next thing is it is very targeted. We're really looking at answering critical questions that we fail to find in published literature really and therefore should be quite succinct and straightforward uh, to complete. Next is we really don't intend to bother you once you have completed the survey. And uh, however, we would love for you to reach out to us and we welcome you to share your comments, thoughts, and even anxieties actually of uh, issues that you face in your country. And we've also tried to capture issues that go beyond you know, the published literature and the so-called knowledge gaps that we identify. So, which is why we've sort of aimed to provide multiple boxes across this entire survey um, that can help accommodate as many views as possible. And uh, I didn't mention it earlier, but we will be using SurveyMonkey, which is a well-established survey online survey platform uh, for the purpose of this uh, survey. So again, um, moving on really, what are we looking to ask you? So as I earlier said, we will ask you some basic demographic information, but really nothing that can tie back to your specific community of residents, for example. The, que the questionnaire will then, once after asking you about demographics, will then move to a section that contains the questions on knowledge gaps. So this in case, for example, would include information on your preferences for uh, uh, clinic visits. For example, would you like to, for example, come to the clinic, let's say, 
uh, would you prefer to receive treatment on the same day? Or what is your preference for the number of visits you would like to have? Uh, so on and so forth. So, and then we will move to a final section, which will contain questions pertaining to HIV status and treatment, because really we're looking to stratify our analysis by uh, HIV status as well. As you know, we've, so, as you saw earlier, we really emphasize that the risks in uh, those people living with HIV is much higher. Um, the next thing is we will also, we understand it's really important to not really just ask of the community, but also share or whatever resources and information that we have that can help you learn more about cervical cancer and how it can be prevented. So I just thought I would walk you through, uh, as I mentioned earlier, about one of the health scenarios that we will have in this as part of the questionnaire. So this is a question from the actual survey, so I'm just going to use it for demonstration purposes. So let's say you have just had a cervical cancer screening. The results say that you tested positive and your doctor tells you that you can be treated immediately. How much do you agree to being treated on the same day? Now, for this type of a question, we typically would use what is known as a Likert scale, because really this is not a simple yes or no type of response, because there's a multitude of issues that inform such a decision or an opinion. So really we're trying to capture the full spectrum of something uh, like that. So in this case, it would span from strongly agree to neither disagree or agree, and then strongly disagree. And also, it's also important to know why. So here we've included a comment box to add any further information that you feel is important. Again, the questionnaire is really quite short. It is 27 questions and we've tried it out a couple of times, well, several times. Uh, it takes about 20 minutes of your time. Um, we aim to make it available in English, French, and Spanish. And the main reason for some, uh, in some sense, uh, not a restriction, but limitation is because in, the, in, in, in sort of the intention of uh, time and also the fact that it's very difficult for us currently to accommodate other languages or into the COVID crisis. The switch off the um, also, we plan to officially go live on the 1st of uh, July, uh, 2020. So this webinar will go live and uh, uh, Julie has very kindly helped say, so you will all be flagged on the day that this goes live. Um, so again, I really want to say, uh, I want to express deep gratitude for all of you having taken time out of uh, your day. Uh, it's a really difficult time for everyone. So I really want to thank you and for your participation and your enthusiasm. Um, also, I just wanted to say that in addition to this, we will be sharing uh, resources and links to information uh, following this uh, webinar. And also, this also includes some of the apps we've been really working on. Uh, so this is the HIV treatment app and the HIV testing app. So we will be providing you with links because then you can download it uh, on either the Google Play Store or iOS. So um, I'm happy to take uh, some questions now for a few minutes and then I have just a few slides um, not actually just a slide uh, for those who will be helping other people to uh, complete the survey. Thanks. Thank you so much, AJ. Um, any questions from uh, listeners on, on those, those slides and the description of the survey? Uh, hello, everyone. Can I have an? Can I? Uh, yeah, right. Okay. So, regard, uh, uh, Ajay, uh, I like, I love your survey. I, I think we really need have to have more understanding of people. Uh, we need to do more research of people why, why they are not this, getting. You found this one. Why they are not getting. Uh, can you hear me? Can you uh, hear Dr. Hadi, we have a lot of interference. I'm not quite sure what that is. Can, can no. anyone else make sure they're on mute? I'm not sure if it is you or that it's just interference. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a, such a great, you know, this uh, survey is very important. But I would, uh, I would try always, in, uh, I mean, I would recommend in, in the answering the question, uh, understanding other culture and other people's opinion. I would all uh, make sure to include the option. I, I don't want to answer the question. Part of the answers for the question. Uh, this is because this is topic that because if you 
push them, to keep pushing them to answer the question, they will stop in the middle of the survey and they stop answering. Yes, that's a Absolutely. good point. AJ? Yeah, that's an, I think that's a very relevant point. And, and uh, this and is actually, sorry. Uh, and one more point, if you could, I know we are, uh, we are uh, you know, discussing sexual disease and, and HIV, cervical cancer and HIV, but you have, to, I mean, one of, in some cultures, if you start discussing HIV, in the question, HIV and cervical cancer, in some culture, they will stop the survey and may not answer it. Because, I mean, I, 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 they will, it's this, uh, unfortunately, it's still this cultural sensitivity and uh, of, of uh, describing, or, I mean, or you need to have a lot of introduction to ease the discussion, or the introduction is not to uh, link cervical cancer to sick, or picture it as a uh, sexual disease, or I don't know how it can describe, because this is something we are we facing. We are trying yeah, our hard when we're educating the community. Cervical cancer is a cancer. It's a cancer, it's a disease. It's, uh, we, it, we, in introducing that to the community, we're trying to uh, eliminate uh, the focus on a sexual disease. Thank, so if you thank are you your very survey, much. Yeah, very, very much, Dr. Hardy. Hardy. We, we understand uh, that double burden, double stigma. Ajay, would you want to respond to Absolutely. questions don't need to be answered, right? Please, please confirm that. Um, no, I'm, yeah, absolutely. This is actually something that, uh, you know, we realized early on and there are options for don't know or choose not to answer, for example. And also as far as the uh, issue that you did point out, which is very relevant on uh, the issue of managing the sexual uh, diseases with HIV status is that it's for this reason that we have grouped uh, the HIV questions all together at the end of the survey. It's just two questions. So the reader will have plenty of time to answer all of the other questions and then may choose to uh, disclose their HIV status or not. And that's completely, of course, voluntary because there is an option to say, I choose to not uh, respond to that. So yes, absolutely, your comments are well received. Thank you. I totally agree. I would leave uh, the HIV question to the end of the survey. I, I, I mean, I know it's very important, but if you start with that, you will get a lot of uh, people stop in the middle of the survey and stop answering the question. Yeah, that's absolutely what we have done. Thank you very much, appreciate it. So Ajay, maybe you could just give the, the, the one the further slide about the, the yes. guidance. Um, the, the idea here is that given um, we are using an electronic survey um, and of course we have the COVID challenges in most of our communities at the moment, um, Ajay's put together just a, a short description of um, you know, how you can support um, people completing the survey, um, but not maybe go too far. Uh, you're yeah. over to Thank you. So this is just sort of like, um, I, won't even, I won't go so far as to say it's a do and don't. It's just mostly how best you can help somebody, uh, not help really, but assist them to answer a survey. So really the, the key aim is if in the event that somebody's having difficulty answering the survey, uh, the goal really is to facilitate and clarify a problem that they have while answering a question. It's also best to avoid expressing your personal views because really we don't want that to alter the way they necessarily respond. Um, avoid suggesting a specific answer in the sense that you're trying to run them through the logic of a question, for example. So that would not necessarily be helpful because it may reflect your personal preferences. Um, of course, it's really not necessary or nor do we expect you to actually read every question for the person doing this questionnaire because really that's really difficult to ask of you. And also, really the idea is if we can clarify what's being said, I'm sure most people will be able to answer this survey. And also this will ensure that your assistant does not affect how a person will respond to a survey and remains there uh, independent of you. Thanks. Thanks very much for, the, uh, for that, Ajay. Um, any, any further questions on the survey? Um, can we all count on you by the 1st of July or, or very soon after to help pr promote and disseminate uh, the survey out to your community? Because you know, what we really, really want is this is uh, perspectives from women at grassroots level, really suffer, you know, faced with the challenges that we've heard about today.
So uh, we do hope that we can count on you. Um, did you mention, Ajay, that it will also be uh, in Spanish and French, the, the survey? Yes, I did, absolutely. Uh, just yeah. a couple of slides ago, actually, yes. Right, okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm too busy reading the chat on that one. Would you guys have it in Arabic? Um, we do not have it in Arabic, huh, Ajay? No, we don't. Unfortunately, I think this has been a very challenging uh, time for us and it's been really hard to, you know, find uh, translators really because we've been just completely overwhelmed by, uh, needless to say, COVID-19. So I think we really chose to try to restrict and make sure the survey actually goes out. And like I said earlier, this is really a starting point and we really wanted to do this to know how we can do it better the next time around. So that's, that's sort of the aim here. Thanks. Thank, thanks very much, Ajay, and I, I, I do hope that um, you've enjoyed this, um, this conversation. I see from the chat that many of you have learned a great deal. I do hope that it's um, opened up your ideas to consider new research in this area and support some of the, you know, the weaker areas that aren't really represented in the literature. And I also hope it's given you some thought about how you can start to work uh, with colleagues in, in the HIV space uh, from the cancer perspective um, and, and vice versa, that we can maybe work more closely together on this. Um, learning from some of the experience that we've seen from the tool, for example, that Mandula uh, showed earlier. So I'd like to hand over to WHO colleagues maybe to make some closing remarks. I'm not sure who's on, so I'm a little bit of a weakness here. Um, Nono, are you still on? Would you like to make some closing remarks? I don't think that Nono is... Um... Well, if I can see I know, her I think there, I can see, maybe yeah, I can she's see on, there. maybe she's still on mute. Yep. Um, or, or Ian, would you like, ah, oh, there you go. <laughs> there okay. you go. Go ahead, Nono. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Maybe, uh, uh, Natalie, would you like to make some closing remarks on behalf of WHO? Oh, yeah, great. Well, um, I was, uh, as I was mentioning in the chat, I think that was a really, uh, extraordinary discussion uh it's just a start so that's our first gathering together i think i know we have lots of challenges and you know the guideline is one step to do but i was as i was mentioning and as it was said by ajay and other colleagues really the uh to take into consideration values and preferences in the recommendation it's just not it's, it's just not only a word, it's just, you know, it's something very important that we really, and we really want to take that into consideration. And having done that, we will have to do all the work, and I think it was clearly stated by the um, different speakers today, and principally during uh, any sessions, that, you know, from the recommendation to the guideline, how to engage to, to the implementation, how to engage the community so that it's really um, down top approach and, and that will be really the solution to increase uh, the screening coverage and the treatment coverage. So we, we, we will continue this discussion and maybe we will do some different groups, working groups, because um, we will prepare implementation guidance and we will have to think of that with, with you on how to write this implementation and how to be different so that we think a little bit out of the boxes we, we can be in sometime and that we really manage to get to the, uh, or, or, or to really try very hard to get to the 2030 target. So that's what I really want to, to, to tell all of us here that the first discussion uh, that we're starting now and we will really need the, your uh, feedback, input, support to go to the implementation and that will not be done without you know people benefiting benefiting of the intervention so a long way to go still but we, i think we i've heard that we are all ready to take the challenges uh, ahead of us so thanks a lot um and uh, thanks also julie for having facilitated and organizing uh, all this great discussion thank you very much all the participants thanks Thank you, Natalie. I'm sure everyone from civil society is uh, very excited to hear that there'll be additional opportunities to contribute to this process um, and make sure the guidelines are really uh, very important, uh, very speaking to women 
and, and really a right for civil society to be that conduit to communities. So thank you everyone. I know it's been a bit challenging with uh, the communications at times, but thank you so much for the information you've put into the chat. Thank you very much for any questions we didn't get to. I will, uh, as I said at the beginning, endeavor to write a, a report and bring your perspectives in. And as you've heard from WHO at the end, this is the starting point of the conversation. So I hope that we can count on you to be active contributors in future. So thank you very much and good rest of day to everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Nice to see bye. you all. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.